Hello and welcome to this Expats Portugal webinar, Portugal Calling, talking tonight, calling Daniel of Crad Studio, Crad Design Studio. Great to talk to you again. It's always very informative and illuminating to be in your company as an architect here in Portugal. Daniel, talking tonight about building and renovating. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, uh, as I was saying earlier, I'm busy with life, uh, injuring myself. Uh, trying to get out, trying to spend time with family, but also trying to keep up with the work. So. A lot of multitasking going on then. So thanks for being, thanks for fitting us in. Busy, busy time of the year. Uh, great to have you here. And I think uh, you want to start with the presentation. Uh, and so whilst you're doing that, while you're getting that onto the screen, uh, let me encourage everybody with any questions at all about building or renovating here in Portugal, uh, get those into the chat sooner rather than later. And we'll put those to Daniel as soon as he's finished sharing his presentation with us. Yes, I'll try to... Um do this in 30 minutes. I think it will be faster. If I'm taking too long explaining things, please just tell me to hurry up. Okay. I don't mind. Um, we'll bring you a coffee. Uh, okay, do you have my screen? We do, we see your yeah. screen. Perfect, thank you. All right, so uh, just a quick introduction. Um, uh, we are a small architectural company in, in Portugal. Um, and we have bases in other places which with partners, we collaborate to do bigger projects. But in Portugal, generally, we focus on residential projects, typically single um, freestanding houses, three, four bedrooms, swimming pool, etc. But sometimes we do townhouses as well, especially the, the first chunk of design, the planning application phase for townhouses. But we specialize in small, beautiful little houses. And I don't want to use the word boutique or high end because they categorize architecture. And I don't think architecture should be uh, just serve, serve those areas of uh, high end. We serve everybody. And uh, whatever your budget is, we try to tailor the design to meet your budget. And I think I've said it a couple of times uh, on screen recorded so you can, you know, Keep me at that, that you can build a house with 200,000, with 200, 250,000, with architectural services, with an architect, custom made house. So it's not necessarily expensive in Portugal to build a house, um, which is good. Uh, and it kind of liberates architecture. Where in some parts of the world, architecture is the, the playground of the rich. In Portugal, is very affordable. Uh, so I'd like to talk today about. Uh, the architect's role in Portugal, architectural stages, very fast. I won't talk about the boring bits of how to create drawings, etc. Uh, and then um, the construction methodology, and I, the, the question I typically get, um, what is best, modular, prefabricated? What's the difference between modular and prefabricated? Prefabricated. Um, what about a standard? Is it should it be steel? Should it be timber, etc. So we're going to go through that, and then I have some costs. And this is hot off the press. Um, just this morning, my wife was talking to different organizations to see what is the square meter cost for construction right now in Portugal. And at the end, we'll focus on the questions. Um, OK, so let's get into it. So the architectural services, as most of you probably know, but I'm going to reiterate, um, it starts with finding a land. And uh, I get surprised a lot of people don't know that architects can inspect the land, analyze the land to see if the quality of light is good, if the views are good, if your house can fit in it, if you have enough a square meter available by the council to build what you want to build, if you can have a swimming pool, etc. So the services really start at, at the beginning. If you're searching for a land, you can always um, get an architect to, to analyze it for you, to see if and do a um, a feasibility study to see if what you want to build can fit in that land. If the council allows that in that region, if you want to do modern, if you want to do classic, and also get a good understanding of where the sun rises, where the sun sits, uh, and what kind of material you want to use. The top one is a project we are uh, working on in the, in the middle of the country, in Evo, and the, this is the view from the, from the terrace. So you can have really beautiful views in Portugal also. 
And the, the first stage of architecture, preparing a brief, focuses on talking to the client and understanding what is their need. Uh, sometimes they don't even need architecture. They just need to you know, refurbish their existing house and they'll be happy. And um, I think a, a good architect shouldn't necessarily push for a new build. Um, and a good example of this is there was a school that uh, wanted to demolish half of the school to build more rooms. And they had a conversation with the architect and the architect's proposal was, well, just release the classes in different times, five minute intervals. So they don't all crowd up the corridors. So the solution was a new bell, then a whole new architecture. And I think that's the important conversation you should have with your architect if a new building is really a solution for you, or um, every refurbishment is better, or a new or re maybe prefabricated. So going through that initial uh, options and setting up a brief of what are your needs and what do you want to get out of building a house. Uh, and the architect should help you with those questions, answering them and developing a list of requirements. And those list of requirements typically go into the, into the framework that the architect can then work towards to accomplish all your needs. Um, please interrupt me if you wish. Um, sounds a little bit quiet. I don't know if you have my sound or everything is okay. We've got you, yeah, Daniel. That yeah, you're perfect. sounding fine. And the questions are coming in, which is great. Okay. So these are the, um, I'm not gonna read through them, but these are the, the first stage. These are the sort of things that are covered in the first stage. Uh, and we tend to also start to look at the site and the materials we can get from the site to incorporate into the design. The second stage, it gets a bit more interesting where we put a volume on the land. So um, we hopefully by this stage, we have a good brief. We've developed the brief, we can develop it further. Um, we can define the external cladding, whether it's black, corten. We can define what color is the pool, what color is the building, how tall is the elements, um, how deep is the swimming pool, if there is terracing. So all the external elements that the council would be concerned with would be at the stage two. Uh, uh, Danielle, the, Danielle, there's a request for you to speak a little bit louder if possible. Yes, sorry, okay. <laughs> And um, I'll come closer to my, to my screen. I think that will help. So I was saying the second stage uh, concept design um, focuses on the external envelope of the architecture and everything that the, the council would be concerned with. Uh, typically in Portugal, the councils are only concerned with what the building would look like externally. So we need to know all the materials of the doors, of the windows, of the finishes, and that uh, will inform the planning application. And if we need a pre-planning meeting with the council to confirm some things, to, to run through the feasibility of the project, that also is possible. You have to understand pre-planning uh, pre meeting and pre-planning application are two different things. Uh, in some countries, you have a meeting and you submit the papers on the same day. Uh, UK is typical, but here you, this, pre-planning meeting is just a meeting. It's a two hour meeting. You ask any questions from the planners where the application itself can go in two weeks, one month later uh, as a set of documents, which then later inform the process on. Uh, as architects, we also oversee the surveyor or any other um, person involved into the, in the process. So if you have a landscape designer that you love to work with, uh, or if you have any, another entity that wants to work with us, right? a building, you know a builder right from the beginning. So we, we collaborate with all those right from the beginning. The third stage of the architecture is preparing the design for sufficient detail for planning application. And this is the boring bed we, the, where we create these, these drawings with dimensions and specifications. And we really understand what the internal spaces all are, how they work, what is the flow. Uh, and we submit the planning application. So is a planning application, there's a, there's a thought that planning application is a set of plans, sections, elevations, and that's it. But uh, it is in Portugal and in most parts of the world, there is, there is photos of existing, photos of proposed if it's going to be, so visualizations of proposed. It's going to be um, what is going to be demolished, what is new, what is going to be retained. There is a surveyor, um, drawings, 
and that's just the drawing, but then there are the explanations, the forms, the engineering documents that go with it. So there's a big chunk of documents that need to go in, typically 100, 120 pages of different things. And the drawings is basically 20% of all of that submission. Um, and the question I get is, and what are the drawings finished? Can you submit to the planning application? And then I say, yes, the drawings are finished, but then we, ha we haven't finished the whole reports, the explanation, the justification of the design, the, the context, et cetera. So the stage three, we submit for planning application. The council loves it, says, yes, go build it. And then say, hey, hooray, now we get into the details of inside and the interior of where is the bathroom? What is the bathroom? Where, where do we buy it? What product is the tap? What are the tiles? What color are the tiles? What are the wall finishes? What do you want the inside to feel like? Where, uh, and hopefully in the previous stage where we define the windows, we know where the light is coming in. Now we can say, oh, I want timber floorings with timber beams. And I want to render the walls where it's really warm and cozy. I want a black fireplace because I don't like the smoke that comes out of it and it destroys my, my wall above usually. I want a kitchen with 120 uh, cupboards and drawers. So all of those details come at stage four, which is post planning application. And this is the stage uh, for refurbishment. So if you're not doing a planning application and you're just doing internal refurbishment, we come in at this point. Maybe Daniel, can I just step in there just to, yes. just to check with you? These are your designs, are they? These are these these visions of beauty we're seeing in front of us. This is your not work. The, the middle one, yeah, the middle one is not mine. The others are mine. Wow, beautiful. With the drawing and the bottom one. But yeah. this is not mine. This is uh, by, it's actually in, in north of England. But it's a very well-known architect, uh, English architect, that we always refer to because the, the mood that he creates is identical to one. Like yeah. it, could, so. it looks like your kind of style. Astrid pointed out to me that uh, the uh, design on the uh, the promotional uh, slide for for tonight's uh, show for webinar is your work. So that was ab absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So prepare architectural specifications, and specifications are basically these little dots that say what is the tile, where do you buy it. And sometimes we provide the fee, so we say it's this much per square meter. Sometimes we don't. It depends on what level of service the client needs. And the, the bathrooms, the taps, uh, the shower heads, so where you should buy all of them, what are the tiles, what company provides them, what is it, how much is it per square meter, etc. So that is the specification. Uh, at this point, we invite builders. So we do a tender process where we send all of these documents and drawings and uh, specification to specific builders and they come back to us with price. Typically, we try to aim at three or four builders to get, get a good range of price. And in Portugal, you can get prices that are wildly cheap and wildly expensive. So you need to really understand uh, if the builder is gonna finish his job, is too cheap or is too expensive and where we should land. But the cheapest one is not necessarily the best one in terms of builders. Um, especially the ones that don't read the information fully and then later understand, oh, these tiles are really expensive. So I priced this incorrectly. Uh, there is a, a little bit of um, space into adjusting the budget because the builder made a mistake at the beginning, but not too much. So you have to be very cautious of what the builder uh, quotes and how much is that realistic what percentage should be allowed for tolerance. And then after the builders, we select the builder with the, the, the client. We don't do a direct contract with the builder. The contract is between the client and the builder, but we oversee the contract, we recommend things obviously, and we oversee the builders to execute as per the specifications. So buy the tap and the toilet and the tiles, everything that was specified and the client liked and agreed to. Stage five, um, we go into construction. So excavation, this is, this, this, I don't know if you see my the scroll, then, but this is Vera, my partner. Um, and this is our site uh, that we're now doing in Dorf Village. 
that's on top of the hill, really good views. So first is excavation, um, typical construction, form work, and you start to build the architecture. And we deal with the architect, uh, the clients upon fees. So if there are other other people the client wants to work with, if they, if they are build it themselves, etc. So and we have to take um, inspect the site regularly, whether it is a refurbishment and we lo are looking only at the inside or right from the outset if the level is being excavated at the correct level and it's not too low or too high. So it's even if you're doing a project just with a builder and you don't need an architect and you think, um, I know exactly what I want, a builder can do it, get an architect to oversee the, the construction because this is a point where everything falls apart because builders, builders tend to do what they think is correct and not necessarily what was agreed between the client and the architect. So then we come to stage six, which is uh, handover, landscaping, any other fine tuning. And this is also an important one. So if you have an architect involved at the construction, they should do a, a snag list where they check the, the project right at the end and make sure all the details are correct. Uh, whether it is the lighting, whether it's something broken or something messing or, or light fitting is the wrong one, the architect should point those out to the builder and the builder should correct it before concluding the, the contract. And then last stage is interior design. If you need that services, you'd be going to selecting furniture, doing a shopping list, buying the lighting, et cetera. Now, quick, um, quick notes on what we just discussed. Uh, return of investment. Um, a real estate agency in London called uh, Modern Design did a, a thorough research of what is the value of a house where it's well designed, architected, and not. And uh, they found out that houses that are similar to these pictures, good quality, designed by an architect, the space is thought about, light is thought about, typically sell 20% more than market value. So that already covers your architectural fees and even some of the builders. Too. So if you're building a house of uh, half a million, suddenly you have. Uh, it's 20% more of that. So it's, it's, you can sell it for 600 rather than half. Excuse me. Oh, dry, dry throat. Now, sustainability is not necessarily, I mean, it doesn't mean just use sustainable materials. Sometimes um, efficiency and longevity are better for sustainability. And if you look at some of these old buildings, the stone buildings that have been around for 500 years, they're probably much more sustainable than the modern and uh, well insulated buildings because they've been around for 500 years. <laughs> they were not demolished 50 years on. So um, it's important to consider the materials you use um, and the efficiency of the spaces inside. So how much heat you lose, and how much heat you gain from the sun. If you're going to need to run their conditioning all year long. So although you have the uh, good views, maybe then your house, your house is hot all year round. So you need to think about those things in terms of sustainability when it comes to. It. And question your architect because sustainability, although it's been in the game for the past 30 years, um, it, it requires education. It's an addition to basic architectural education. So architects need to inform themselves of what are the sustainable methods of building. So do challenge your architect on that. Local councils. Um, I hear a lot in Portugal that uh, local councils um, work with local architects. And uh, that's typically a fallacy, typically I'm saying. So of course there is corruption everywhere and there is bias, but the councils are, um, so we work throughout Portugal and uh, from north to south and the councils are very good in responding to us. and uh, most of the case, they don't even ask where we're from, where we're based. So a low, it, the concept of a local architect or a local council doesn't necessarily make sense. And there, it's, it's a red flag by itself because if they have a relationship, um, you might not want to get into that kind of 
environment where they're friends and they can talk and they can decide things and it's not all legal. Councils are not allowed to, by law, by Portuguese law, to recommend architects. It's uh, unethical. Um, and they're not allowed to be biased. And in most of the cases that we've worked throughout Portugal, councils have um, been very professional um, and answered to us in timely, timely manner. However, a new law is coming into place three weeks ago that requires councils to only ask one set of questions to the architects and the clients. Uh, and so they cannot constantly ask questions and delay the process as they usually do but only propose all the questions, put all the questions into one set, one basket, and propose it to the architect and the client to answer, which means uh, it's very good because the councils cannot delay the process anymore. And they have, uh, the architect has 10 working days to respond, the council has 20 working days, and that's it. No more another 20 days after a new question, and then another 20 days after a new question. So there's only one set of questions that the councils can ask the architect, so, which will help a lot. Now, the new build or refurbishment, there are two different worlds. I get that, I get asked that all the time, um, and there are two different worlds. I, um, as an architect, you know, shooting myself in the leg, but there is no need to put more substance on earth. There is already enough material in the world. If you don't want an extremely custom made a space, just refurbish. Buy existing property that is old, has a lot of character, and refurbish it to become a good home. You don't need to necessarily build a new house. If you need that customization because that's your life dream, then do a new build. That's all I can say. In terms of um, cost, in terms of uh, location, in terms of return of investment, they vary so much that they cannot be compared. Now, um, about construction methodology. So I, I tried to put this in here really quickly because ev everybody almost asked me, what's the difference between modular and prefabricated and what is cheapest? Can I build a house with 150,000? Somebody told me I can have a prefabricated house with 150. So to, to get it out of the way, modular means a single module, like a whole house or parts of the house that go together. Prefabricated means it is fabricated in a factory, delivered on site, and bolted together. So prefabricated is typically walls or units that lock in together. Modular is a, almost a whole house. And traditional, I call it standard here, is build everything as usual. Bring your brick and mortar and concrete and build it from scratch. Obviously, the modular is the fastest because you just block a house, but you still need foundation, electricity, services to go into it. So it's not extremely fast. The only planning application, so it's not that because it's modular, you don't need a planning application. No, everything new needs a planning application. And a good concept to remember is whatever modifies the, the urban realm, the public realm, uh, requires planning application. So if you if somebody will walk next to your house and will see it, that needs planning application. So modular is the fastest. Uh, prefabricated is fast, and traditional is typically slow, lower than the others. So they call it slow here. And modular typically has no customization, so you get what the factory or the manufacturer has already organized layout, and typically they're very uh, space fixed and they are smaller because they need to be transported. So even if you combine three of these modules, you still have the narrow corridors and the restriction of transportation. Um, a five meter house will not um, be easy to move. So these are typically three and a half meter wide. So you can imagine most of your spaces are three and a half, maximum four meters long. Uh, prefabricated. Because these are wall modules and they're fabricated in the factory, you can do whatever. You can have um, a lot of customization, except sometimes what is the wall build up? So how thick is the wall and what is the insulation and what is the structure of that? And because this is delivered to the site, it has to be lightweight. So it has to be 
uh, sorry, I forgot to be loud again. Um, it has to be timber or steel. Traditional is uh, fully custom made. So you can have whatever you want. And therefore, because you can have whatever you want, you can have concrete, you can have rammed earth, you can have a steel mixed with um, timber, you can have hay, you can have any material because it's fully custom made in the traditional. Whereas uh, prefabricated needs to be a lightweight material. So timber or steel structure, same with the modular. Uh, in terms of quality, modular is typically low quality. I say low, but it's the low range of acceptable. So of course there's planning application regulations and they cannot be illegal. So they're at the low range of acceptable, but still good. If, if you, my view is if you want to build a new house, build a new house. Uh, either prefabricated or traditional. This is not really necessary. You can get a house and refurbish it rather than a modular. I mean, that's my view of modular houses. And they're getting better though. And the quality of the prefabricated can be very high because they're made under controlled environment. So outside the rain, no dust, they make it in the factory, bolt it together and assemble it on site. So the quality can be very high. And uh, the traditional, uh, the, the quality varies from very low to very high, depending on the builder, the conditions. But the construction methodology is typically more dirty. You have dirt and you have excavation, et cetera. Uh, in terms of cost, the modular could be slightly cheaper if the site is perfect. By that, I mean, if you don't have a hill, if the soil conditions are perfect, if there is no surprises when you do the foundation. If they're not perfect, then you're gonna end up paying almost the same price. However, it will be faster. So you're making an uh, exchange of a speed or, or budget. Prefabricated, a similar deal. Because the quality can be higher, it's made in factory, uh, and it is faster because it's just made in factory, delivered, assembled. Um, the process can be faster, but the price is almost identical to traditional construction. Now, uh, these are some pros and cons. Faster, um, better for lower budgets, but minimum customizations and typically low lifespan and quality. Where the traditional is traditional construction. And I think that's why, looking at pros and cons, that's why a lot of the houses built with traditional methodology still even though the technology allows us to do really good prefabricated, we're still doing a lot of um, traditional construction simply because of the customization. The, the amount of custom made things you can have with, um, with the standard house, whether it's ram, earth, or hay or concrete. Ah, cost. Let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow, okay? Um, it's perfect, Daniel, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So this is, um, my partner Vera is a, also an architect. By the way, we're both architects and we have other architects. Um, by that, I mean qualified Portuguese architects. So I sign drawings, I have uh, ethic codes that I need to follow, etc. My wife also. And we have experience around the world, but now we're here. The cost. So my wife today called a couple of places to get, to get precise costs for right now, what's happening. And there are a few different costs um, per square meter. The first is um, the, the tax purposes. So the tax office will charge you per square meter. Would they will consider your house to be between 532 square meters? So that's what the tax office will consider your house to be in Portugal, 2023, where um, the construction association, the builders, provide information to the council, and the council uses a different value: 525, 545 per square meter. But that's not anywhere close to reality for construction. This is just for the council use and for tax purposes. When you come to the insurance companies and they want to insure your house, they use closer values. You get into 670 to 840 per square meter, and dip, but that's only on traditional construction, brick or concrete blocks. The insurance companies in Portugal are very difficult to convince when you have um, a steel house 
or something that they're not familiar with. Now, the National Institute of Statistics this morning told us they use the value of 1,170 for construction. And there is a simulator that you can go from an insurance company, which is actually very accurate, surprisingly. Should I click on it? Let's try. You're so breaking you Translate to English. Uh, it's less in translate to English. So if I do a home, central Portugal, uh, concrete buffer. So do you see they only have the standard construction methodology. It's either concrete or stone or masonry. They don't have timber or steel or prefabricated or modular or any of the new systems. Let's go with masonry. Uh, 160 square meters. Huh? Are you okay with that? Is that a good house? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. How many toilets? <laughs> Dream home under construction right here. Right <laughs> <now. laughs> All right. No, let's say we don't have a pool. And then let's spend in the storage room. No, let's not. Let's just leave it all out. Uh, let's just see. Let's see what happens. Wow. It'll cost 214000 to build this house, which is very close, actually, surprisingly. 1,344 square meters. Central mm -hmm. Portugal, 160 square meters. Typical construction. So this, this simulator is actually very really useful. Right. Thank you for that. I can go back to my presentation. So that it's in the link if you like to use it or copy it, or etc. Uh, another note is the construction cost in the past couple of years. You you can see it has rocketed because of the Ukraine war, but now it's on its way back to almost where it was in 2021 January. The the black is the total. The the blue obviously you can read it. It's materials, material cost, and uh, the pink is the labor cost. So it seems good. The future is bright. Prices are coming down. Lastly, questions. And this was the site we looked at earlier. And the views are really good for, for, for central talks about this, which is very dense. And um, okay, I'm going to leave it here. That's great, Daniel. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry if it was long or... No, um, not at all. It's really, really informative and uh, loved all the angles, pardon the pun, um, with, you, with your presentation there. A superb job. And you, you have addressed some of the questions in part. So that was really helpful. Um, really good to know as well. I think some people have the idea of coming to Portugal to build their dream home. And it was very reassuring, I think, for you to mention that that is, that is accessible in the way that it has become an accessible and exclusive in many countries. It's still possible and within reach, it would seem uh, here in Portugal. And the, also the um, adding value as, as, a, as an architect there. That was an interesting point. 20% uh, an estimate of uh, architect designed homes uh, would, would add to the value uh, in that way. So that's good to know as well. And it's always nice to see that. I think it, it does sort of pe prick people's ears up, doesn't it, to, to hear of an architect designed home when seeing a listing. So you do get a certain distinction uh, going through this process. Thank you very much indeed. So let's go to a few of those questions and we'll take the general ones um, before we go to, uh, before we switch off the recording and um, we can go to more uh, private and personal questions. Um, so some some really good questions coming in that uh, that uh, you were inspired there. Um, is it possible to build? This is a classic, isn't it? From Connie. Thank you, Connie, for being here tonight and asking. Is it possible to build a tiny home in Portugal, a building that isn't on wheels, uh, such as a caravan or trailer? So technically, of course, it is, and they're very fashionable at the moment, aren't they? The tiny homes. Yeah, absolutely, it's possible. It's 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 allowed. It's possible. the The tricky thing is that. Um, some people want to do it in protected land. So because it's on wheels, it's a debated, debated uh, territory, but it's a permanent house or not. So they want to buy a rural land with amazing sea views or no neighbors and put a house that is on wheels or on train tracks. So, um, but because you need services, you need electricity and you need water, you cannot do that on rural land, but if you if you do it on urban land, absolutely, yeah, it's possible. Wow. Okay. And and some people think of that as a bit of a planning hack, don't they? That if it is on wheels, um, it's not a permanent residence, and think they they may be able to get the better of a camera on that basis. It's not worth the trouble, is it? Doing it something like that. It depends. It depends what the wheels are doing, right? If it's <laughs> right. if you can roll if you can roll your house to the edge of the site where it has really good views. 
Wow. But uh, maybe it's windy <clears throat> and you don't want that in the winter and you roll it back to within the trees, then fine. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. But, but not, as a, way of getting, not as a way of getting round planning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's you amazing. Need to, that's you a... need to see why you put it on wheels. What's yes. the purpose of that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, okay. <clears throat> go ahead, Jerry. Sorry, it's just, I think the question is if it's not on wheels. Um, ah, okay. Yes. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm not reading the questions. I'm just yeah. Yes. Sorry, I, I went straight. I went straight to the. I, I think I threw you there, Daniel, by going straight to this hack around um, uh, uh, the idea that if you build it on wheels, you can move it and therefore circumnavigate uh, literally okay. some of the planning rules. But I think you've dealt with that, and you've brought in a new design inspiration as well for a, a home that could be moved according to the time of year. So thank you, Jerry. What if it isn't on wheels? The building of tiny homes that are not on wheels, and these could be some of those modular homes that you uh, told yeah, us about, yeah, couldn't absolutely. they? Yeah, or pre. Again, why, why is it tiny? I mean, of course, maybe because you don't need the space, but is it because of uh, site constraints? Is it on the slope or is it, you're among a lot of trees and you want to be small uh, or you just like to be in a small space, but is it possible? Yes, the council allow it. Yes, absolutely. They appreciate it because you're not altering the landscape as much. And um, so absolutely, yeah. So there you go, Colleen. And and actually it's becoming a it's becoming a bit of a niche um to to do those and do and hope I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but have more than yeah. one house. Yes. Have yeah. You of these little houses that you can you can be in, in different parts of the uh, different times of the year. Yeah, or even rent them out. I, I think that's that's another aspect to this, isn't it? To have a number of tiny homes on a site, some of which can be let out on an AL basis, yeah. um, which, which of course, I, I'm sure is a project you'd be able to take care of as well, but that brings in the AL aspect that people would have to consider. Yes, some um, sites, depending on the on the land, require you to build it as a, as a holistic unit. So you cannot have many fragments in the landscape. Uh -huh. So you need to um, make sure you consult with an architect or the council when you're thinking about having fragments of little houses in the landscape. Okay. Because some some plots don't allow that. There's a consideration, yeah. If you're thinking of building a sort of multiple dwellings from for a commercial point of view, uh, that's a, a really good consideration. Thank you, Daniel, for that. You did you did address this, but I think it's worth uh, returning to. Thank you, John. Daniel, do you work across Portugal or in one particular region? Across Portugal. So we did a um, dance studio in Vienna de Castel. I don't know if you know where it is, but it's one hour north of Portugal. I'm going to update our website, actually, and put the photos. Yeah. So uh, last year, uh, and that's three hours drive from where we are, and we work all the way south in Algarve, and that's approximately three and a half hour drive from us. So right. yes, all across Portugal. And po in my point of view, Portugal is not that big. So yes. I can drive it. In, in one day there and back and have four or five hours uh, meeting on site. Great. And just in case we do get asked, Daniel, what about uh, Madeira and the Azores? At the moment, um, we have a colleague that is there, but no, not necessarily. We do the first stages, so the planning application and the design, and I recommend um, that we as architects collaborate with the local architect for the construction phase. Right. We oversee it right there. That they're okay. here and they have a foot on the ground. But right. we definitely can do the planning application. Okay, that's great. Good to know. Uh, Roz is asking Is there a potential issue emerging in Portugal with building new swimming pools given some issues uh, France is raising around water shortages? Are you hearing anything to do with water preservation through the architectural industry? No, not yet. I haven't. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the Portuguese infrastructure needs a lot of improvement. Yeah. Um, one one article I read last year that they lose forty percent of uh, the water that is uh, cleaned and refined yes. in the pipelines. So they have forty percent leak in the system. Incredible. So I think swimming pools are not their main concern at the moment. <laughs> right, but it, it it's worth. Thank you, Ros, for putting that into the conversation. But it's not an issue here in Portugal at the moment. There's bigger issues no, to deal with clearly. Um, does CRAD assist? Thank you, Wilson, for this. Does CRAD also assist with smaller remodeling projects? For example, moderate changes or kitchen upgrades, adding insulation, heating um, in an apartment, for example. Could you help with that? Yes, yes, absolutely. And um, my, one of my conversations before I, I spoke about one of the houses we did, 
which was uh, 45, um, 89, sorry, 89 square meters. So it just it was a flat refurbishment. And all they wanted to do was a new kitchen, new bathroom, and uh, refurbish the flooring and open the living room, but also give it some privacy. So we added some fins. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's small projects um, are, are fun. Are Wonderful. Fun so worth getting into. Don't have the headache of the headaches of the the difficulties, headaches of the construction, and you just select materials and you play with the design and choose the right kitchen and talk to the manufacturer. So it's it's really fun. Yeah. Absolutely. You make it sound like so much fun. Um, uh, fun Laura, Laura, Laura has. Well, it's, yeah, absolutely. Laura has a similar question. I had my apartment renovated two years ago with a lot of problems left, unfortunately. Um, so so some snagging, some serious snagging going on there in the alcohol by the sound of it. Uh, now it seems impossible to find somebody that will come and make the professional work, electricity, floor, etc. cetera, um, to just even quote by the sound of it. Would your team do that as well? Uh, that is Alba Feira. So it's construction. Uh, no, I think there's... I think it's something that's gone wrong, isn't it? Uh, and things yeah. that need putting right. It may be a little bit too small, but it's perhaps worth having a conversation, getting in touch with you through the business directory, and you can decide for yourself on a, on a one to one there. Absolutely, yeah. But uh, to build on that, um, we uh, what we can do, and we've already been consulted um, about this sort of thing. We do a list. Builders tend to not respond to clients because they get a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they respond to proper drawings and a set of information. So, if the information is coming from an architect, they know the project is going to go ahead. So, they are more willing to get involved. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So, if you have a list, what we can do, we can come and make a list of all the defects and the problems and draw out some solutions for them and get builders to bid for that or to, to attend the process. Then that might help. Oh, that's great. That, that may be very reassuring for Laura. So thank you for that, Daniel. Uh, how long, uh, asked Gilles, uh, how long does it take approximately to get an approval uh, on, an, on an application from the council? Now, this is a bit of how long is a piece of string kind of question, but I'm guessing you've got some rough ideas on that. Yeah, well, it really, really depends on the council. So yeah. um, some councils, I let me just sum it up to two to three months. Okay, great. Excellent. Notwithstanding, it was, I think it's like some of the costs we were talking about earlier on. These are obviously subject to change. And these are these are indicative um, uh, answers, aren't they? And pointing people in the right direction. Of course, with any particular council, camera, yeah. project, there may but, be variables. But again, with the new rule, this uh, two to three months is, is becoming guaranteed because right. the council cannot any longer drag the process by requesting a new thing every month and yeah. buying themselves an extra month. Oh, okay. So they can only request information one time. Yeah. So which means that the, the problem is getting resolved. That sounded really good to, to hear rather than using it as a tactic for delay. So that's good to know. There you go, Gilles. I hope that helps with you. Connie, definitely serious about tiny houses. Uh, Daniel, what is the smallest footprint allowed on a new build? That's, good. that's an interesting question. What's the smallest footprint can you you can live on? Um, Sounds like one for the record books almost. There is, I, I think there is no there is no limit, but I think you need at least six square meters yeah. to operate. Yes, to, have a, to live a life. Yeah, yes. to, to, I mean, even if it's extremely well organized and folding and opening, um, but you have to consider footprint is not a total total area. Right? So right. if you have six square meter as a footprint, and then you have, uh, I don't know, 30 square meter above that, yeah. the council considers your house to be 36 square meters. Uh, okay. All right. Good to know. Connie, you might want to uh, open up your mic a little bit later on when we, when we stop recording here and uh, ask a few more questions. It sounds like you have a very particular project in mind. Uh, Michael is asking, what is a typical construction renovation cost per square uh, square meter is there a range low to high end specification and i think you've you've addressed that to some degree and thank you michael for the question contingency allowance though um you, i'm not sure you covered that what what sort of contingency would you t tend to work uh, on you for refurbishment i think we covered the price a little bit right now you should look at my um, view of it 1100 1200 per square meter mm -hmm. for for a refurbishment uh, okay. or a new build yeah. But you should allow 
uh, no, sorry, uh, refurbishment is a little bit cheaper, so around 800. Yes. Refurbishment 1,200 for a new build. But you should allow 20% of it. Have 20%. an extra 20% in your pocket uh, because things will change. Yes, yeah, uh, for because there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, variables in these sorts of projects, of course, and uh, the uh, possible. I mean, it was good to see that costs are coming down uh, from the graph you showed, but who knows what's going to happen in the future? Uh, Warren, good to see you here this evening. What trades can an expat perform on the construction of a re or a rehabilitation of, of a house? Um, I have had a construction company for many years in my home country, so I think that's a question about how, can you come over here and just practice your trade. Um, without um, getting licensed or registered? You need to get Alvaro. So uh, uh, you need to register yourself and get insurance. And, but it's not difficult. We, we are also qualified as, um, as a company to build. Yes. Um, because I like to do little things for myself. Um, so it's not difficult to, to get to do it. Yeah, I think you can come. The difficulty would be communication with suppliers and other trades people so yeah okay great uh connie asking i think we do need to speak to you connie um and we'll close the recording in just a moment and don't forget dream team session starting at nine o'clock this evening as well the link is in the chat for that um do you design using natural materials such as straw bale adobe etc are these building practices allowed in portugal and of course that's cue the earthship question because that often comes up as well doesn't it yeah absolutely it's, it's our favorite favorite category of construction oh is it right okay yeah. using those new and and well some of them aren't new are they some of them are very old in fact very old, yeah. but not often absolutely. used absolutely yeah. We, yeah we use it and we love it and to that end we have a an environmental specialist that is based in london that informs us how to exactly do those things so yeah uh, and straw bells and ram ram there are our favorite Wonderful. Excellent stuff. OK, um, for much, this is a GC uh, for much older homes in poor, unlivable conditions. And uh, there are plenty of them around, of course, especially in central Portugal. Is it financially worth renovating or tearing it down and starting over? That's a great question, isn't it? I mean, how do you make a call of that kind? I uh, personally like to retain as much as possible, not necessarily because it's. Um, because it needs to come down, but or I don't like it because of the character and the history that is there. So personally, I like to retain as much as possible. If uh, if it's uninsulatable, or I don't know if that's a word or not, but if you cannot insulate it, and if it has a lot of leak, then keep as much, but use it as a feature. Yeah. Don't make it a structural. Okay. Um, I, I think I think the call here is, is specifically about a, a, a financial one, isn't it? But from your mm. point of view, aesthetically, you would you the would only thing you would preserve. save uh, if the walls are usable, then yeah, yeah you obviously save about forty percent of the total construction cost. Ah, okay, if that's the a good walls measure. are not usable yeah. uh, and structural. At least you have the foundation, so yes. you, you save fifteen percent on the total construction cost. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. I'm sure we'll go deeper into this uh, when we when we uh, stop recording and have some more, more of the personal and private questions coming in for you, Daniel, tonight of Crad Design. Um, awesome news, says Sarah, about the rule changes. Thank you for sharing that tonight, Daniel. And Warren continues, I've ha heard two different opinions about house construction. Some say that uh, wooden houses may be constructed on piers on rural articles. Others say it must be removable on short notice, such as a yurt or caravan. Are either of these permissible uh, wood construction and yurts and caravans? Um, there's a few questions in there. <laughs> yes. Um, timber structures are still a structure. They need some sort of foundation and they need services, electricity and water. So they cannot be uh, positioned based on a rural land. Depends what that use is. So some rural lands allow agritourism, so you can build agritourism um, functions on them. So therefore, yeah, you can. But just because it's the timber structure doesn't mean you can build it on a rural land. Mm -hmm. Same again with the car caravans and camper vans. Um, no, because you would still need electricity and you would need water. And those are not, um, and the services and the, the functions of the, of the 
caravan is not the same as what a rural land would need. For example, if it's a storage of hay or if it's a, something required for agriculture. Okay, so bottom line here is it's a good idea to consult your camera, isn't it? I think some of these questions tend to want to make yeah. assumptions that camera approval isn't required or that you can do certain things based on a certain understanding. But it's a good idea, isn't it? Certainly if you're working with an architect to have the camera involved and just tick all the boxes and make sure everything's okay. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But but building in rural land is very difficult. So unless right. unless um, unless you have uh, some ideas about if it's going to be agritourism or if it's going to be semi-agritourism and how you're going to pitch it to the council um, and if, if the land to categorization allows, then it's better to stay away from it. Yeah. In my okay. view. All right. So uh, just a couple more then, um, a couple of quickies here. Um, Mike T is asking, is there a huge difference in cost in regards to what areas of Portugal um, uh, what, what, I guess it's the land cost that will be hugely different. It, his comparison is the Silver Coast or the Algarve. Silver Coast rapidly catching up with the Algarve, of course. But that's that's where the big difference will be, won't it, in land costs? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, however, construction is a little bit more expensive in sort of a harsher areas. Uh, if you're building Kishkaish, it's probably an extra 5% more right. expensive. Okay. Um, than building in the center of the country yes. or building in the city centers are a little bit more expensive as well so if you're building in central lisbon or central Porto, a yeah. little more expensive but <laughs> i see you were laughing about cash cash i'm sorry i don't want to Anna knows this yes yeah of course well then um, finally we can return to all of these themes uh, in just a moment everybody and, and we'll make sure we'll answer as many questions as we, as we possibly can um but just, we'll finish on the recording here with um a, a question from jen does portugal require architects to be licensed or certified how do you know that you're hiring a legitimately trained professional what should people ask Yes, the Portugal requires an architect to be certified and have a board of architects number. So right. you can ask with their board of architects number, call the board of architects and ask if this person exists. Yeah, perfect. So just, just like a lawyer or an, an accountant. Yes, your professional body. Exactly. Yeah. They're ethically great... bound to. Which, of course, you have and you can be found in the Expats Portugal Business Directory. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Great presentation, says NTR. Obrigada, says uh, Daniel from Connie. Let's get into thank some of those personal questions as we pause the recording right there.